Bone physiology. There are four parts that we're going to go through. Overview composition, structure and ossification, remodeling and hormones, as well as fracture repair. Part one, we're gonna do deal with overview and composition. The skeletal system has three main functions. One is structural in that it provides support for the body, protection for our organs, and leverage to allow our muscles to create movement. So bones don't make movement, muscles do. Bones provide support and leverage. Storage of fat and minerals in a thing called and hematopoiesis, which is a fancy name for blood cell formation. Bones have stresses in many directions. It not only has to be thick and strong enough to handle the heavy weight of our body for compression, but it has to resist stresses in many directions. Muscles pull on bones from many angles. Movement can cause rotational types of pull on your bones. Bones must be hard, but also flexible, like a strong tree. It has to be able to hold the tree up, but also bend when the wind blows. The ability of bone to withstand stress, in essence, is its strength. Strong bones can be flexible to handle torsional stresses and also hard enough to withstand compressive stress. The bone's ability to bend come from the organic components made up mainly of collagen fibers. The bone's ability to handle weight and pull along its axis is the inorganic component, which is mainly calcium hydroxyapatite, a compound that gives bones its strength and rigidity. Thus, the organic components allow for bones to be flexible and withstand strain, while the inorganic components provide the hardness of bone to handle the weight. Some important micronutrients that make up bone are vitamin K, vitamin D, vitamin C, calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium. When people think of bone minerals, they can't get past the calcium. But in order to have healthy bones, you have to have a balance of all of these in addition to others, not just calcium. Just like building with concrete, you need both the cement and rebar rods. The rebar is like the collagen. It's there to give the cement something to bind to and prevent it from crumbling when stresses are put on it. This is an example of no rebar or little collagen in bone to withstand the shear tension. In bone, the loss of collagen would make the bones really brittle and easily breakable with little torsional strain. This is an example where the concrete wasn't strong enough, then the rebar bent under the pressure. In these examples, we can see bendy and brittle bones. On the left, we can see that the bone, you can, is, bone is twisting. You can actually use torsional strain and it twists like a rubber band. So this is an example of too much collagen, excessive organic. There was the loss of calcium in it. So this bone is very bendy like Gumby. On the other side, we can see if bones are really brittle and break and shatter easily, that means they don't have any collagen or they're a significant loss of collagen and they have too much of the inorganic or just the hardness of bone. Bones also have membranes. So around the outside of bone, in this image we can see a bone that is raw. Um, these are knee bones from an elk. The one on the left, you can still see some muscle as well as some connective tissue. The periosteum is indicated on the raw bone on the left, and then there's a bone on the right that's plastinated where the muscles have been removed, but it's been plastinated so it's preserved but you can still see the periosteum or the membrane that's on top of the bone. It is dense, regular connected tissue that binds and fuses with the tendons and the ligaments. Endosteum is actually the lining of the inside of bone. So here we see the periosteum is a membrane covering the outside of bones, except the joint capsule region. So it's on the bones itself. Collagen fibers of the periosteum, they are what's connecting and how our tendons and ligaments connect to the bone. Endosteum, that's going to be the membrane covering the inside of the bones and it's lining the marrow cavity or central canals. We'll get to some of the bone anatomy in a little bit. 
So osteocytes, anything that has the, the suffix site means it's a cell. So an osteocyte is a bone cell. Osteoblasts are a type of bone cell that actually builds bone. So exercise stimulates osteoblasts. Progesterone actually also promotes long bone growth, stimulating osteoblasts. Osteoclast with a C actually breaks down bone. In order to have healthy bone, we have to have a regular building and breaking down constantly. So osteoclasts do play an important role. People with bone regression issues like osteoporosis just has an, have an imbalance where they're not building bone, but they're only destroying bone. So osteoclasts are increased by acidic enzymes. Um, they're stimulated by the body requirement for minerals. So if you're not consuming enough of our basic minerals, the body will ask the osteoclast to break some bone down so it can release it to the body. So the bone is really our storage of many of our minerals. And if you're not going to consume them and eat a healthy diet, then your body's going to have to take them out of your bones. Estrogen slows down bone breakdown, but for menopausal women, they don't realize that all estrogen does is it stops the breakdown, but it does not build bone. You need progesterone for that. Bone cells here in summary, we can see osteoblasts build bone. The exercise, testosterone, progesterone are some ways that you can build bone. Osteocyte is just your bone cell and osteoclasts break it down. Chronic inflammation contributes to that as well as low estrogen or poor nutrition. So for part one, you should know what the main functions are of the skeletal system. You should know the difference between the organic and inorganic elements of bone and what happens when these are out of balance. If we have too much organic, is your bone going to be bendy or brittle? It'll be bendy. If you have too much inorganic, will it be bendy or brittle? It'll be brittle. You need to name the membranes found on the outside of the bone, periosteum, and those that line the inner cavity of long bones, and that would be endosteum. And name the osteocyte that can build bone, which is an osteoblast, and one that can break it down, which is an osteoclast. Part two. Now let's look at the structure and bone growth, which is ossification. Bone is a specialized connective tissue that is created by layered rings, much like a tree trunk. The fundamental structure of each layer is collagen fibers arranged in a layer with all the fibers going in one direction. Then the collagen becomes mineralized by calcium hydroxyapatite. Then the next layer is the same with collagen fibers in the opposite direction. Compact bone is the bone you can see from the outside. It's the smooth, hard part of bone. It is made of very densely packed columns of the mineralized collagen layers. Each of these layered rings grouped are called osteons or haversion systems. A single osteon or haversion system is like a single tree trunk with growth rings. The compact bone would be several groups of these osteons or haversion systems lined up next to each other. We can see here an in the compact bone, the osteons are represented like these straws. They are all packed together. So when we see models of an osteon or haversion system on the next slide, just know that it is one of many that's going to make up, all packed in together, the edges of our bone, which is the compact bone. We already know each osteon is made of layered rings of mineralized collagen in alternating directions for strength. The very center is a space where blood vessels travel through. These vessels travel up and around in compact bone as well as through the branches of spongy bone. This central space for blood vessels is called the central canal. The central canal is surrounded by a series of circular layers of bone called lamellae. Between each lamellae are small spaces where osteocytes live called lacunae. These osteocytes are inactive osteoblasts that have been trapped in the bone that they had created. Canaliculi are tiny cracks through the lamellae to the lacunae, which provide a space for nutrients and waste to be exchanged with the osteocytes. 
Volkman canals are larger tunnels that run perpendicular to central canals, connecting one central canal to another. The arrow is pointing to the central canal with the blood vessels inside in the diagram. On the histology side, you don't see the blood vessels anymore, but that's where they would be. Volkman's canals are not seen on the histology slide on the right, but we can see them on the diagram on the left. Let's review the features and functions of an osteon. First, we have the central canal for blood vessels. Lamellae are the successively larger rings of calcium and collagen. Lacunae are the black oval spots between lamellae where osteocytes are found. Canaliculi are the tiny black lines that radiate out from each of the dark lacunae. These bring nutrients to the osteocytes inside the lacunae. We can see in this image the spongy bone. The spongy bone is, has pores in it, so there's spaces inside, so it's a web-like structure of bone that's found at the end of long bones or in the middle of flat or irregular bones. Here are some examples of flat bones, which is in the skull, we can see in the image on the right, or an irregular bone like a vertebrae. So those are filled with spongy bone. On a long bone, they're listed at the ends. The space between the scaffolding of the trabeculae in spongy bone is filled with red marrow. Trabeculae are the beams of bone that are not made of osteons because there's no real central canal, but they're just layers of bone. They're like the lamellae of compact bone. There are also lacunae containing osteocytes, but the canaliculi that bring these cells nutrients don't connect to blood vessels, but instead open up to the spaces so the nutrients from the bone marrow can actually feed the osteocytes. Within spongy bone, hematopoiesis, or blood cell formation, takes place. This region contains stem cells that make a number of different types of cells that we can find circulating throughout our body. With the weight of the torso pressing down on each thigh bone from the hip joint, you can see the lines of force. In this closer view, you can see the trabeculae of the spongy bone more dense in the high stress areas, and the alignment of the trabeculae actually follows the force vectors. Bones come in many unique shapes, each containing spongy bone inside and compact bone outside. Long bones are a little different. This is a diagram of a long bone. The bulbous ends at the top and the bottom are known as the epiphysis. It's made of compact bone on the outside but filled with spongy bone on the inside. The surface that goes into the joint has hyaline cartilage capping those ends. The diaphysis is the name for the shaft of the bone. It has compact bone on the outside, just like most of the rest of the bone, and the inside actually has yellow marrow, which is contained mostly is fat. The main feature of long bones is the shaft of the bone in the middle. This region is the diaphysis. It's made of compact bone around a center space like a tube called the marrow cavity. Within the marrow cavity is yellow marrow which is essentially fat. This is where the fat storage function of bone takes place. The large bulbous ends of bone is called the epiphysis. This region contains spongy bone and red marrow where hematopoiesis takes place. This area is surrounded by compact bone, but the compact bone is much thinner here than in the diaphysis. The ends of the epiphysis have articular cartilage to protect the bone inside the joints. The metaphysis is the region between the diaphysis and the epiphysis where the bone begins to widen and flare out like a funnel. There are two types of ossification or bone formation. The first is endochondral ossification, which is the formation of long bones using cartilage. The second is intramembranous ossification, which is the formation of flat, irregular, and small bones using membranes made of connective tissue sheets while the bone cells produce bone inside. Endochondral ossification begins at the embryo stage when all the bones are only made of hyaline cartilage. Through the fetal stages, cartilage elongates as the limbs lengthen and bone cells begin to form in the center of the diaphysis. 
these bone cells begin to ossify or put in bone structure the area around them. They're producing collagen and calcium hydroxyapatite. The bones continue to grow and elongate while the bone tissue fills in on the diaphysis creating a medullary cavity that will contain yellow marrow. By the time of birth, a second area of bone with the epiphyseal ends are ossifying that region creating spongy bone. We will focus on the growth of long bones after birth. So this is the sequence from the neonate through after birth. The main time that you will need to know and you will be asked questions from are going to be the postnatal bone growth. Growth occurs from the epiphyseal plate, which is commonly known as the growth plate. This is made of hyaline cartilage, which is continuous with the cartilage around the outside of the bone or the epiphysis. What happens, and this is happening at both ends, we're just showing you one end in this image, is that the cartilage grows away from the center outward. And so in this picture, it's growing upward, but at the other end of the bone, it will grow downward. The process is that cartilage in the epiphyseal plate is being followed by osteoblasts, laying down bone tissue. Then as the bone continues to grow, osteoclasts remodel and remove some of the bone. So cartilage cells basically lay out where bone is going to go. Bone cells are following behind and mineralizing as it goes. So we see the epiphyseal plate, which is the growth plate here, and it's also made of hyaline cartilage. The cartilage is growing on one side, which is going to be in this image, the red side, followed by the bone tissue invading behind it. So the more the cartilage is growing, the more the bone has to invade behind and the taller the person will be. So endochondral ossification really requires the articular hyaline cartilage. It has the epiphyseal cartilage inside, chondroblasts, that's the cartilage cells, they're forming cartilage on the leading edge, and osteoblasts are forming bone coming in behind. The basic process of endochondral ossification is that the chondroblasts create a template for the osteoblast to fill in. We can see here that the green are the chondroblasts, we can see, say, in the femur on the top in red, moving downward towards the knee with the blue osteoblasts or the bone cells moving in behind. In the tibia below, we can see the same process. In the image to the right, we can actually see a histology slide closer up where we can see in the green, the green arrow is representing where those chondroblasts are going, the cartilage cells, and the blue in that histology slide is showing the bone cells invading. Although hyaline cartilage is one continuous formation, it has two distinct regions. There's the articular cartilage on the outside to protect the bone within a joint. That part of the bone faces another bone in a moving joint will have a cartilage to cover it. It sort of like, acts like a bumper. The cartilage inside the bone, inside the metaphysis of the bone, is known as epiphyseal cartilage or an epiphyseal plate. This will go away after puberty and the person will no longer have the ability to grow taller. We can see here the articular cartilage and the epiphyseal plate inside. We can see on the left are epiphyseal plates in a prepubescent individual. It looks like the bone is broken, but it's just cartilage, so that's a normal growing bone in a child. On the right, you can see the faint line where in an adult where there is no more cartilage and the bone has filled in, and that's known as an epiphyseal line. Now we'll go over intramembranous ossification. Other bones than long bones don't use cartilage as a template to grow. These types of bones, like flat bones and irregular bones, grow from ossification centers. 
that deposit osteoblasts that deposit bone tissue as spongy bone, and then it moves outward, radiates outward in a pattern between the membranes that form the shape of the bone. As you can see, the fetal skull with a prominent ossification centers inside the membrane. The areas that have not yet filled in with bone at the time of birth is actually known as the baby's soft spot. There, it's still just a membrane. That allows for when the baby being born for the head to be more maneuverable to make it out the birth canal. However, over the months post or over the months after birth, those corners literally fill in with bone through this intramembranous ossification. Here is a fetal skull. We can see the soft spot here at the top, and you can see some ossification centers and the thinner bone growing as it radiates out. You should know from this section the type, what part of bone that you can find compact bone in. What is compact bone made of? Those would be those haversian systems. Name the features and functions found in an osteo osteon. So you should know about the central canal, the lamellae, the lacunae, the canaliculi, and the Volkmann's canals. What is spongy bone made of? Those are the trabeculated bones and the red marrow. What is hematopoiesis? That is bone cell making. And where does it take place? In the red marrow. Where is the spongy bone located in flat or irregular bones? And how are long bones different? Name the anatomical features of a long bone. And you should know about how long bones grow and what the name of that process is called. And you should know how flat bones grow and the name of that process. Now we'll go through factors that affect bone remodeling through hormones and the role of various hormones. The skeleton is in a constant state of growth and destruction, maintaining healthy bone while the growth and destruction are in balance. Increased construction or increased thickness density of bone occurs when more force is placed on the bone. So you use it, maybe you're stomping around doing high impact exercise, that's gonna increase the thickness of your bones. That's why your dominant hand has a little more bone mass than your non-dominant hand due to muscle use and development. We can see here osteocytes are the bone cells. They're found within the lacunae of osteons. We have osteoclasts that break down bone. They release calcium into the blood. So when our body needs more calcium, it just tells the bones to break it down so we can put it in the blood, which is really why we need to eat more calcium and magnesium and have it in a regular diet. Osteoblasts, they build bone also occur when you have excessive amounts of calcium that needs to go into bones for storage. Impact exercise increases bone mass due to the forces being placed on bone. These forces include the jarring and pounding of impact as well as the pull of muscles on bones. Exercise like swimming or cycling, although very healthy and wonderful for cardiovascular health, does, does less to improve bone mass compared to higher impact activities. Warning, if somebody has osteopenia or osteoporosis, the force of high impact exercise can actually cause damage to those bones because it might not be strong enough to handle that much intensity. So something along the lines of Tai Chi or yoga would be better for those folks. Conversely, if you're not using your muscles and the bone doesn't feel the pull or strain of muscle contraction, it's gonna reduce its bone mass. This is an effort to conserve energy for the body. Why maintain a higher bone mass when your body isn't using it? In an example, an extreme example of space flight, the lack of gravity, this eliminates the resistance to movement so muscles don't have to pull as hard on bone. Being in zero gravity environment has a very negative impact on bone mass. Astronauts today have to exercise with special equipment for two and a half hours each day to help them maintain their bone mass. And we can see the image of an astronaut up at the International Space Station doing just that. Two most important hormones to know regarding calcium balance in the blood are parathyroid hormone and calcitonin. The body uses calcium for many uses. When you don't get the calcium through the diet, the body will take it away from the bones by using parathyroid hormone to break down bone and get more calcium in the blood. If there is too much calcium in the blood, the body wants to reduce it. 
It starts by sending calcium to the bones while also increasing the excretion of calcium via urine and reducing the absorption from the gut. So when calcium moves away from the normal range, homeostatic mechanisms engage to return them to normal. So let's see what happens. If you have high blood calcium, the thyroid gland is going to sense you have high blood calcium. Or if you have low blood calcium, the parathyroid gland is a sensor for that. If you have high blood calcium, you're going to secrete a hormone called calcitonin. If your blood calcium is low, on the other hand, you're going to secrete parathyroid hormone. Calcitonin in the, from the thyroid gland in the high blood calcium state is going to stimulate osteoblast. It's trying to say, we have too much calcium in the blood, we need osteoblast to build it into the bone. In the low calcium state, parathyroid hormone says, we don't have enough calcium out in our blood. We need osteoclasts to break down the bone so that we can add more calcium into our blood. So in the end, in a high blood calcium state, calcitonin will decrease blood calcium. In a low blood calcium state, parathyroid hormone will increase blood calcium and bringing it back to the normal range. There are many more hormones that have an impact on bone physiology. Here are a few more common ones you should know. Growth hormone, androgens like testosterone, progesterone and thyroxine, which is another thyroid hormone, can increase bone mass. Estrogen doesn't build bone, but it does slow down the breakdown of bone. When we're stressed, cortisol is released, which can contribute to bone breakdown. Growth hormone is released from the pituitary gland to produce growth of bone and other tissues. Long bones elongate during childhood while the epiphyseal plate is present. If there is an excessive amount of growth hormone during childhood, the person can get a condition known as giantism, which makes them taller than average. If there's not enough growth hormone during childhood, then the person will get a condition known as pituitary dwarfism and be much smaller than average. These conditions affect the height of the person due to excessive or insufficient growth hormone during childhood. That means when the epiphyseal plates are open. In adults, when the epiphyseal plate is no longer present, an excessive amount of growth hormone cannot make the person taller, but it can stimulate other tissues to grow and enlarge, resulting in a condition known as acromegaly. This is characterized by a thickening of the hands and face. So what you should know now are what conditions in the body would increase or decrease bone mass. You should know two hormones, the two main hormones that affect blood calcium levels, calcitonin and parathyroid hormone. You should know which one raises blood calcium levels and which one decreases blood calcium levels. You should know some other hormones and what their effect is on bone mass. You should know the conditions associated with high or low growth hormone in kids or while the epiphyseal plate still open, and you should know what acromegaly is. And what does vitamin D do to help bones? Finally, let's go over the steps to repair a bone that has been broken. There are fractures. A fracture is a crack or a break in the bone caused by physical stress. There are four main steps in this repair process. Step one is a hematoma. This is the reactive phase. It's filled with clotted mass of blood that's establishing a fibrous network. Osteoclasts are trying to remove damaged tissue. We have a lot of inflammation during this time, and this can last for actually several weeks. This is why it's important to have the bone set at this time. Then a fibrocartilage callus forms. This is the reparative phase. This is when collagen and cartilage are growing within the break. The cells of the endosteum and periosteum are working to together to create a large bony callus. We have an external and internal callus. This lasts for about three more weeks. 
Finally, in the bony callus phase, our osteoblasts are replacing the central cartilage of the external callus. We're replacing it with spongy bone. This is lasting for several months. Finally, we have bone remodeling. Osteoblasts and osteocytes are remodeling up to a year. So you can have a larger or thicker region in the bone break. It's sort of over, overcompensating for this weakened point. Um, and over time, this bony callus is going to reduce. So in the fracture repair, you should know about the hematoma, the fibrocartilage callus, the bony callus, and the final remodeling.